I would like to welcome you again, and sorry for being late, about 10 minutes. Uh, allow me to welcome our two panelists, Mrs. Eliane Metney and Mr. James Connell Ward. Uh, as you must have already read on the website, Mrs. Metney has uh, been a co-developer and co-founder in many programs and associations related to education and training and transforming schools. Uh, Mrs. Mr. Cronel Ward is a technologist who has worked in the development and implementation of many systems regarding industries and especially the human industry of education. They have both accumulated so many years of experience on the ground and in the field of education that I tend to joke about it and say they have accumulated more than a hundred years of education and experience compressed in their relatively young age. Uh, but let no man despise your youth. So I leave you the ground to talk about today's topic or this panel's topic, which is the use of technology, the good use of technology in education. Mainly, I leave the ground to Mrs. Matnim, please, Mrs. Matnim, for that. Thank you so much for the introduction. I retain from this that I'm with the youth. <laughs> uh, <yes. laughs> that was very nice. Uh, thank you all for participating in our session. I just would like to say that how we'd like to host the session, rather than I speak fully at the beginning and then James fully uh, after, and then you start with your questions, we're going to have a common introduction where we combine what we're going to say and uh, feel free to, as soon as we're done with the intro, to interrupt and uh, ask questions uh, that, that you think are pertinent to what you can use and how you can make use of it. Okay? Yeah. <laughs> um, I would like to start to say that yesterday, were you here yesterday? Yes. Okay. A lot was said about what we use and how we use technology. And we spoke a lot about the digital natives. And what came out at the end of each session was how we use it critically. How we're going to engage our students to think differently and to think, to be critical about our use. What we do with it is what is important with it. Um, it was very, it was at the end of every session that came out with it. And uh, the director general said, ended with educate and educate, which is innovate as you educate young students. When we look at, when we think about the digital natives, as we referred to them yesterday, we think about the youth as knowing everything, right? They're born with technology. They know how to use it intuitively. Do you have space? I'll just wait for them to sit down. When we refer to the digital natives, we think about them as being born in the digital age and being it's part and parcel of their lives. They use it intuitively, they don't think. They can do, be doing several things, they can talk to you, and we all see it. Talk to you, but they're texting. They're doing something and they're reading. It's just part of their being, it's how they're behaving. But they use it intuitively, they don't need to really think about using it. What we're claiming here is that we need to develop a new way of using technology so that it becomes part of not only advocating 21st century skills, but actually applying them. So that the students, they're excellent users, but they're not actually making use of it to construct their knowledge. How can, you help, how can we all help students to make use of the technologies to construct their knowledge rather than just to use knowledge. 
and be users of and media, they're recipient. They receive media from all sorts, from news, from, from Facebook, from all the technologies that they're using. They're constantly exposed to media and they're good. Yeah, of course, they use it very well. But how are they building their knowledge with it? And what we're trying to say here in the session is if we can do things differently and we're going to propose what we're doing to, instead of only advocate them but apply 21st century skills so that the students are able to communicate better, problem solve, and share what they're doing in their learning. By giving them small challenges, they can grow into more complex challenges and they can be producers of this knowledge. Before I continue and give example about um, what we did in Dürer I would like James to speak a little bit about why we're, we're proposing the solution. Good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us. Um, I'm from UNICEF Innovation Unit here in Lebanon. And um, why I'm working with Eliane is because I believe that uh, we can reach uh, far more students uh, through the use of technology and, and modern teaching techniques. And together, we're uh, embarking on an initiative called uh, pi for l which we'll explain a little bit later on. Um, and my job here in Lebanon is to figure out how we can use technology primarily to reach some of the most vulnerable children we have in the country. Uh, we're at a situation where we have uh, an unprecedented amount of children who simply do not have access to education. Uh, there's, there's schools overrun here in Lebanon due to the crisis we're in, um, especially the uh, Syrian refugee children. And, and my job is to try and figure out how can we reach those kids, how can we uh, provide solutions that can um, give the kids an opportunity to uh, access basic education. Um, together with Eliane, we think that using um, the, the new way of teaching and the technology that we're working with, we can help do that in a sustainable, scalable way. Uh, so we're going to talk to you a bit about today about what we're doing and the kind of techniques we're using and the future of, uh, of what we're doing in Lebanon. Thanks. So the example that I'd like to give is a very simple example of trying a new technology in a school, in a public school. We were lucky enough to have uh, a donation of 10 Raspberry Pi, 20 Raspberry Pis to school in Durashwer. And the first instinct you would have would be to say, let's start and didactically teach teachers and students to, if you do this, you'll get that, right? That's, that's the first thing that anybody would have. And that's what we're trying to, uh, to think differently in terms of how we're approaching both teachers and students. So if I want my students to change the way they use it, I also want my teachers to think differently in how they're learning about it. So we delivered the pies, and we were supposed to have a high-level training coming from abroad uh, in September. Unfortunately, the events in September didn't allow us to have the, the two persons coming from the UK to start the project. It was impossible. So we had to think and, trouble sh and, and, and think about, okay, we have a problem, we're going to think differently. So the whole training was canceled and we decided to have an experiment with the school. And we gave them a very high level guidance and saying, this is what you need to aim at and these are the guidelines you as a teacher can give your students. And if you give them this small challenge at the end of that phase, then they will be able to have in one hour, that's what they need to try and achieve in an hour, is a small challenge to achieve that much. Rather than just tell teachers that's how you need to do, what you need to do, you need to think about what the students need to do. Of course, the environment at the school was very receptive. So the the Raspberry Pis weren't in a, in a place just thrown out. So leadership was very powerful in supporting that initiative, in saying it's, a, it's something that I would like my students to think of, not only my teachers. So teachers and students were looking at the pie. Of course, teachers had time to take pies home, think about it, what could they do with it? And their first thing said was, Scratch looked very easy. It looked like a game. When I, talking to the teachers, it didn't seem like taking their full attention. They, were, were, they wanted to consider Python, which was exciting. And it seemed very difficult. 
So they were in a conundrum, what do I do with that? How do I make it exciting for my students? And the challenge was too hard. So we went back to them and visited them on a monthly basis with guidance. If you start that way and you take your students to the next level, you can do a lot with Scratch. And that discovered that they, how much they could do. And today, after um, three or four visits, Seeing what they have achieved is what you would achieve in five courses. The students have overpassed what Scratch can give. Scratch, what is Scratch? Do you know? Okay, so maybe I should explain what Scratch is. I'll let James uh, speak about Scratch, so, and then I'll take on again. Uh, so I think probably before we get onto Scratch, we, does anyone know what a Raspberry Pi is? Okay, so let's start there. So a Raspberry Pi is a very cheap uh, $25 computer. Um, I'm going to show you all one here. I'm going to speak. If I don't speak loud enough, please let me know. Uh, so this is a Raspberry Pi. It's a credit, sized, uh, credit card sized computer. It costs about $25. Um, it's extremely, um, extremely versatile for its, for its size and price. Um, Using just simply one of these, it can, they can connect to any uh, computer monitor or even big TV screens like this. Uh, it uses existing uh, uh, keyboard and mice that you can find in any store, so I've just connected a wireless keyboard here that I had handy. Um, and the reason it's so intriguing is because uh, for its cost, we can do uh, a, lot, a lot of things, from, from education all the way through to programming, uh, for small kids and big kids of, you know, uh, 35 and beyond. I, even myself, uh, before I started teaching this to children, um, I, I, it was something I had a few projects with, and it's very, May because of its cheap. Sorry? May I just interrupt yeah. you? One of the reasons the Pi was created was because the students um, of computer studies were not, were dropping in level. And they weren't really up to the level they had the previous years. So the creators of the Pi thought of something that they can, and they asked the students, why? Because you're just using technologies, you also don't want to ruin the technology you have. And then by having such a thing, parents are not scared of ruining the technologies. Sorry. Yeah. So the, what Eliab is saying is that we have a generation where our, ch our children aren't really adapt to technology. We're living in an age where technology is accelerating a lot, uh, a lot more quickly than we can grasp it. And it's important for children to grasp this earlier on, you know, what technology is, what it can do for you, how you can learn from it. Uh, so the, the introduction of the Pi is aimed to solve that at a very cheap, cheap price. And a, a price that is accessible not only to the first world, but also to um, uh, countries all over the globe. Um, so. That's what a Pi is, and what I'm showing you here is the Scratch programming language. Now, Scratch is a, an environment for children to um, very easily learn how to do uh, programming. Uh, and the whole point of them to learn to program is to equip them with skills that they can use in the future. Uh, here, in about, I think it took me about one minute, I put a very simple uh, uh, game together where I can move a character across the screen and uh, when he hits the wall, he, he bounces and falls over. Just like that. It took me one minute. The kids at uh, Dorschweier have made games that take you on a whole journey. What they have done, what they have done is amazing. We'd like to invite you to come and see those projects because they're really mind-opening that what you can do and see them presenting their projects. But now I want to go back to how... Okay, well, on the 16th, we will, we will send an invite through the school and you can all receive it. And it's open to the people in this room. You'll have to respond um, to that, right? Accept the invitation. But I'd like to focus now, now on the pedagogy we followed, right? If we had just told teachers that you need to learn the functions there, what we used to say in providing knowledge. We're used to thinking, I need to know that, I need to study that, and I need to write that. I know it, I pass. We didn't do that. We stayed away from that didactic. And that's what I tried to focus here. Because whichever technology we're going to throw out there, if we're going to use it in an old-fashioned way, we can fall back into the same issues we have. 
It's really about learning and learning and considering learning differently and engaging learners intellectually early on so they bite into it and they're excited and they take that ownership with them. And if it weren't for the leadership and the teachers there, we could have fallen into that same problem. So they really walked with the talk with us. And that's what you need to focus on. If you look at that and you learn the basics, it's great, but then what do you do with it? What's, what is it that you want to achieve with it? And what we, what we noticed there is incredibly powerful because they were able to achieve their challenge, design what they would like to challenge, and there's a diversity of small challenges they've achieved, producing a small song, using that software. And one of those students joined, didn't, was not good at technology. You'd think that coding is only for the technology-versed kids. It was given as a choice, and one of the kids said, I'd like to join. But it wasn't a tech-savvy kid. It wasn't that geek or that nerd and saying, I want to learn more. Of course, in the group, there were some, but there was a diversity. Some were artistic. Some were not at all versed into technology, and they've learned from the others, and they like it. They've discovered their talents. But they had an option, and they had a problem that they were addressing, and they had a challenge. So designing those challenges were, was important, and providing that space for growth for teachers and students was very important. Try to think if you give an exam to a kid and they don't do well, what do they do with it? Do they repeat it? Do they instantly go home and try and do it again? It's a grade, it's finished, it's over, it's thrown. But here it's something that they owned, that they wanted to achieve, and they tried and tried again and tried again. And I asked the teacher, how did they manage? Well, they asked for your email, but I didn't give them the email. They wanted to speak to the persons at MIT. And I found that amazing. Mm -hmm. But they solved their problem. They did. They actually did. And when James met them, I'm not a programmer. Mm -hmm. I'm a pedagogue, OK? I'm in pedagogy. And if I learn this, any teacher can. Mm -hmm. Of course, I like technology, because I've been working with technology for the past 30 years. And I see how teachers use it. And I have been through the wave of what we do. So we do a lot in technology, not only Scratch. But I would never, I could never teach Python because I have no clue how that functions. But the kids are using it, and they learned it. And when James was there, he was like, how can they really ask su such questions? So they were exploring beyond what they've, what they've learned. In a, Small public school, up in the mountain, with a lot of energy. I think what we did really, well, what Eliane did, was equip the students with tools for them to explore the, what was possible on their own. And that is at the heart of something like the Raspberry Pi. It's the kind of idea that conceived it. Um, and this is what we would like to do moving forward, not only in this example, but um, in other disciplines, other subjects. G give students the opportunity to learn on their own, create on their own, not just for it to be a one-way flow of information from teacher to student, but the opportunity to work within a framework to, to see what's possible and to create on their own. And for this to work in a humanitarian context and the, with the work I'm doing in UNICEF, it's really exciting. You know, for the first time in, in uh, the world, we'll be giving children the opportunity to use this technology um, in, on, a, in a global, on a global playground. So, not, so kids all over the world will be using this stuff and, and seeing what they can come up with and learning from the experience. Learning um, skills from uh, the, just the understanding of technology to learning their human rights through doing these courses and, um, and other relearning that we, that we plan to do this summer. So what, we, what I go back to, um, to what we've done in that, in, in the Urushwir, for me, what was very important was to see the motivation, which was intrinsic in both teachers and students, the perseverance that the students showed, and being able to gauge as a researcher how much to give, how much challenge to give. So if it's too challenging, they won't get there. And how, how, much, how to gauge those incre increments, how to scaffold them, so that we can replicate that and help other teachers to grow uh, similar projects and similar designs in their schools. Well, the concept 
if you look at it from, if you sit back and you look at what we try to teach, we try to prepare kids for the future. And yesterday was said, a future that does not, ex we don't know what, pro what jobs they will need. We, we don't know what the future has for our kids. But if they know coding, they have an extra skill that is important for them. And it's an important skill to know, and it is open to everyone because it teaches them to think, even at an early age. It teaches them to design. It teaches them to plan what they want at the end. Of course, if I'm going to do it didactically, it won't work. And that is why that small research pilot at Durashwer is so important because it really proves that we can, we can do things differently. And it's in the power of every teacher and every principal to help students become and explore their talents. We have, I've just noticed that the principal of Durashwer is here. I would like to hear her opinion about this. No? <laughs> Okay, so she, I think she's also inviting you all to her school. Yes. <laughs> I think it would be good if, um, uh, I'd be happy now to open it up to the floor. If you, yes. And, uh, you know, if any of you have any burning questions, um, if you'd like to know kind of more about what we're doing and, and, and why this is uh, very different, especially for Lebanon, um, then please, uh, over to you guys. Yes? Um, I'm so interested in every single accent. The problem is, whenever I'm in front of my device, I'm completely distracted. Right. Any mistake, I'm really disconnected. Does your small uh, oh. pie help me to program anything? Sure. Um, and yes. what? we're doing with Elian is to um, think about the courses from a teacher's perspective. You know, how can we put courses together? Um, it's not enough, as you said, to, to drop uh, Raspberry Pi into a, into a classroom situation and, and expect everything to go smoothly and the teacher to, to, use, it, to use it straight away. So we're working with Elian, um, especially for our summer program, to come up with courses that help teachers teach a course around the Pi from how the the teacher engaged with the Pi and how they transfer the knowledge to the student and how the student and teacher work together to do a course on the Pi. Uh, with the ultimate goal of that course uh, to teach them about, uh, in my situation, uh, human rights uh, for the children I'm working with um, or uh, to help them achieve a project that they have in, in their own mind. Sure yeah. And applying yeah. skills. Yeah. Exactly. The good point is that teachers did it also. Yeah. Teachers did it. The teachers that took it were amazing. So you need to be to also want to explore, and you need to know where to find your answers to your questions. What is amazing about MIT Lab is that there is a community. There's a whole community out there that is there to respond to all your questions. So we're not the only people that are doing this. The concept of learning to code and coding to learn is not new. It's something that, is, that has been advocated by professors at MIT. So if you Google it, then you'll find the professor. He's got an amazing presentation or TED talk about it, uh, about the concept. Just try to think about, you learn to, to read. You need to learn to read, but you also need to be able to read to learn more. So those are the skills you really need to know in order to say, I want to be part of that movement of thinking differently. And where do I find help? And how am I going to use that with my students? You don't know it all? Of course not. But they, we take it a step at a time. And our aim is to help teachers transfer those skills to the students so they can construct their learning using it. A different age group. Yes. Uh, what extent is it? Is it something separate, or is it being contextualized in subject matter classes? It is. I, mean, I think about coding as an important skill, for sure, but it's design thinking uh, is the bigger thing that exactly. I'm And that's something transferable across disciplines. And so I'm wondering, like, 
Is this a separate activity or is this being embedded in across the curriculum? Uh, it depends where you want. So to... yeah, so um, what's happening, in, especially in the UK and the US, um, is that the the pie is becoming um, a core part of the curriculum. So it's replacing traditional um, um, kind of IT sessions. Here. I, I um, know that. We're, so what we're doing in Lebanon is. Well, yeah, what we're doing in Lebanon is trying to accelerate that. So the great thing is that this model is already working internationally. So um, we're working with Eliane, and Eliane is the, the kind of the, she started this movement in Lebanon, and I aim to accelerate it here as well, um, is embedding this kind of like use of technology and, and thinking and learning on technology into the core school curriculum. Can you give an example of how you guys have done that in your school? So the... Uh, yeah, so, so at the moment, um, Eliane has the uh, project of Dorshwe High School, um, and that, the kids of, I'll give you the, the de facto example of this. The, the Raspberry Pi is in a lab where other um, more traditional computers exist. I think they started off with maybe five or ten Pies on one side of the room, and now all the kids have, have uh, transferred from where the traditional PCs were to the Pies. Even though the Pi is, is low powered, it's cheaper, um, it's, more, it's more fun and more engaging for them. So they've gone from one side of the room to the other completely. And now all the other children, in fact, we, I mean, we need to give them more pies because uh, they've, they've well, surpassed the principal the would love they that. Been. Yeah. So it's, it's, I think that really proves the point. And I've, I've seen this, I'm from the UK and I've seen this work there. Um, I used to volunteer my time to teach these kind of courses. Um, in, in the non-curriculum, in the uh, in the after-school setting, um, and now we're seeing it um, be integrated in schooling, and it's happening here in Lebanon. And what we're trying to do now is, as, as well as build this out in the public schools in Lebanon, also give the opportunity to the refugee children in Lebanon, of which there are many at this point, um, and to build uh, both uh, platforms at the same time. To go back to your question of, are you doing this uh, in other schools across curricula, and how does it fit into designing learning? Even in, in your school, I, I'm just interested in some concrete examples of how you we have how given it fits in with, with curriculum, like with the discipline, it does, subject, or we the haven't real used the work that kids are asked to do in school. As the PI or as a concept no, of I'm using not, technology? I'm talking about in practical terms. Uh, can you give an example of how it's been used, integrated with another class, not as a separate activity in the lab? We like can give examples. To do, to do a task that is for the service of another uh, subject. Yeah. In, in the UK, they use uh, the pies a lot in science. So they'll set up experiments um, with the pie as, as the central piece of equipment. So uh, the Pi is very good at this. It has input output as well. So you can set up an experiment where you want to measure the speed of a car going between two light gates. And the Pi is used as the enabling technology for that. In the past, you have to wheel out a computer on a trolley to do this. Right. And now so you take a... Are we doing that here? We're doing that in the, the... That's happening in the UK and other countries. And it's very soon, this can happen in Lebanon, yeah. But remember that this, the pilot at Dorshwai is the first of its kind. So, and it's only been going since uh, May last year. So it's really the beginning, but it's actually, in fact, Lebanon is one of the first countries to kind of uh, take it. What are you well, for? I mean, get on with it. well, no, this is a question I would put back to the government of, of Lebanon. It's no, I think I, I, I think I think the point is that we we're ready to to mainstream this and accelerate this. We need to work with with the government to do this, and and that is like m many other governments around the world for scaling. Yes, we can't we can't go in there with Raspberry Pis and and do something um, that the government has has not endorsed. The government um, has been very good to have this first pilot going in in, in a school in Lebanon. And once uh, they give us the OK, we can then scale globally. We're, we're ready to go. My question, just to be fair, is not about scale. I just want to hear about your project in your school. OK, I'm, I'm going to. talking about the classrooms and the kids in your school. I wasn't even asking about scale. I know you have to work with governments to yes. scale. That's not okay. what my question was. 
but it's a, it's a pilot, you have to understand. It's the first um, uh, interactive session of this kind, and it's amazing that it's actually happened to begin with. Yeah. Now it's happened, we can see if we can prove the model and, and scale it up. Yes? Just again, um, in terms of the pilot, did you set out learning goals um, for the students in those terms? Yes, we did. Um, so, would you be able to tell us a little bit about the learning goals? The learning goal was to learn how to design. That was the goal, for them to implement, to design what they wanted to do, and to test that it works, and to learn why it works or why it doesn't. So they've learned to use all these skills, but they designed their own, we called it project, but challenge. And some have put many, many hours, and they had questions that went beyond what, they, what you would teach if you were to teach just didactically. But th those kids were not preschoolers, they were high schoolers. And of course, each, this is very specific to that case study. So we're looking into smaller challenges uh, to each grade level. We're doing it across discipline, but basically we're focusing on science, engineering, and math together, and language and art together. Excuse me, but uh, uh, let's not feel that this is a sort of advertisement to the project. Uh, you just need to focus on the point that we're talking about making use of technology, making use of technology, not using technology, not being consumers but users, producers. good users and producers of technology and, and knowledge. You can provide your children with, uh, I don't know, very sophisticated PCs and teach them to run visual basics. This, this, this could do the thing. I want to stress on and that. What here is the cheapness of this product and its effectiveness. Yes. The, 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 the idea is to teach them the language of coding, which is a language by itself and which is an objective by itself, and they need it for the... Well, this is an example which was through coding, but my aim, and what I've been doing with teachers across many countries, is to, con to, be, to construct learning so that the, produce, the students are producing knowledge. And we did a beautiful case with an I Do project. So you can use any technology, you teachers, and, and I think that the lady here really stressed on designing learning. When you're starting to conceptualize and change your way of thinking about how you're teaching, then you're able to apply the same concept across any technology. This makes it much easier and much more accessible to all, and coding is a skill that's important. And it makes it concrete and easy to really grasp what is how to construct learning. You can tell them about the Arabic language. Yes, I can. Yeah. I would love to give that example. Uh, we were speaking just, I think that is very important. We were, we were speaking with the students, interviewing them, why they had um, selected the course, uh, why did they decide to join this group, and what is it that they're missing, in the, I, what they would like to see. And I was with uh, Mark, who's also researching with, uh, with me that specific, he was with the, on the interviews. So I'm going to ask him to uh, answer what the students answered. That way you can listen from a third person. It's, it's not me as a researcher saying it. Yeah, uh, what we're evaluating is exactly uh, what you were asking, is to see how this links to study. So first, my, the question was, why did you choose to join this project? Because, and this is something Eliane has mentioned, and it's important to stress within the pedagogical mainframe of the whole situation, is uh, they, they chose because they were curious. We, did, we had different types. One of them was a computer geek. The extreme was a guy who, for him, he doesn't know what the PC is, and he doesn't want to know what the PC is. So it was curiosity that brought them into, into this project. Then uh, they, they started creating things, and one of the reasons they uh, they wanted out into this program because they had a chance to skip Arabic sessions. <laughs> 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 no, this this was very interesting. 
So we asked many, many questions. At the end of this interview, I asked them, they were about 16. You can be sure that they all liked Arabic sessions like the one that said I was getting there. I asked them, would you be interested in coding to learn Arabic, for example, or Qawaii, or Qawaii? All of them, all of them answered yes. And the computer team said, we can make it interactive. We can make it that you ask the Mafoldi and it's wrong, it becomes great, but they started talking. So now the next step is to go into uh, learning learning language, Arabic, which is supposed to be the most dry and, you know, untechnological language ever, which to me it's not at all, because I know what's behind Arabic. Uh, so now they want like to go into Arabic. Uh, the question you asked is extremely important that I was expecting to see again how to, she, how to link this code in the mind of the student to the teacher. How does it help in grammar, how does it help in science, how does it help? And Elian, what Elian was trying to say is through challenge. And this is a whole chapter that she goes through teachers, through challenges. And from that challenge, we have seen these three terms she has used. Motivation. I think I all of you know that motivation is your biggest problem with your students. I am always good at young assessing because my part of my work is market research and analysis, so I go, I take notes, I watch, I see what's happening from afar because the, the trainer doesn't see it. Motivation is the key word that's everywhere. We have seen students motivated they spend overnight, and you should have seen them, I should have had the camera when they answered all of them at the same second, yes, we will program to teach. It didn't take them more than a split second to start thinking. There was a quiet after that question, and then they said, well, we could do this, we could do that, I could use this and this and that. It was amazing. It was unbelievable for them to consider how they could transform learning language and make it alive. I could do this interactively. If I put this here, if I put that, I was like... It was in a split of a second that it... But that took a silent, silence, and all of them together said, wow, we can make it. So this is how you can link it to Arabic, to science, to English, and um, I also would like to say that there is a whole MIT lab, uh, which is kindergarten to um, high school, about just using Scratch. There are thousands of resources out there uh, about helping teachers become integrate that into their learning. So there is MIT Kindergarten. Uh, they're developing a new software for preschoolers even. So that we stay away from just this click to think more about combining things, achieving things, even at an early age, and creating. So it's a, it's a movement that is happening, so we're not the only one doing it. And they've done it across cur curricula, and we're happy to continue in Durushwer. So we'll always be step ahead, uh, because it's also very receptive to that. So there is a receptiveness in teachers, and that's where you, as educational leaders and teachers, need to think, how do I take that step? Can I? think about failing forward? If it doesn't work, what do I do? I think that's a good point. I mean, uh, it kind of, I, it's not just down to the technologies to move this movement forward. It's very, um, the teachers have a massive role to, to play here. I mean, Dushwa High School, they took it upon themselves to try something very new and radical. Not every school in the country is doing that, and not every school globally is doing that. It's, it's very much down to the teachers as well to kind of uh, embrace this as the students are. The, I mean, the students, as you know, they're a younger generation. They're, they're adapted to this. For them, this is, this is great. They'll, they'll take to it like a duck to water. But the, student, uh, the teachers, they also need to kind of uh, open their minds up to this and, and see what's possible. And I think we proved through the, the pilot through Dushwa High School and, and hopefully more this summer, uh, and, and other countries globally, that this has a, a, a really big part to play, um, and what the possibilities are by, by just accepting a new method, a new form of teaching, 
into your school, into your classroom, and, and, uh, and seeing what comes out. And it does apply to every subject. So if we, if we wanted to apply it to language, to math, to science, we're developing those examples and making challenges incremental per age so that the teachers can think differently as they use it. But I go back to give it, I want to give the example again in Durashwe. Um, the, the students have another activity, they're doing also robotics. And in the robotics, they're using a different language than they're using with the Pi. So the concept is how the pedagogy that you want to follow. So are you just going to tell the students how to program and just leave it? Or even if their program is not the perfect one, what they've developed, they've developed it. The teacher respected that. They respected that they're learning from what they've wrote, written. And to think, how could I have done that in, with different steps? Those, the, those are the thinking processes that we want our students to think with their teachers. Not to say, I have a competition and I'll bring an expert and they have the right, the perfect essay or coding or robotics. It's a different concept of work. And that's what is needed. It's allowing students to be who they are and to become learners. The students have learned to learn. They know where to find their resources. And they come back and say, that's what we did. What did we do wrong? Maybe yours is better, but explain to me. And the teachers respected that. But we're just so geared as adults into the best. And get somebody to tell me, and how do I show that? That we forget the processes in between. We, if we are able to respect those, we may fade forward, but we will get there. In a change of pedagogy, with the students, irrespective of which language they're learning or which skill we're trying to pass on or what they're trying to construct. Um, building on what you said about the change in pedagogy, uh, does your project include the step further taking it more into studying uh, what type of changes is, uh, changes needed in the other subjects that are not directly enough for this particular project? What I mean is, uh, you notice that students are motivated, they got excited, they, they were uh, more autonomous in finding resources and using them and answering questions, mostly uh, asking questions. Uh, does your project include anything related to transferring all this new knowledge and skills into the regular traditional classroom where they are still, after doing all this marvelous work, they still have to memorize uh, something and do a test with a pencil and paper? and uh, go back to hate everything about it, but they have to because they need to get the memory. So is it part in any way in your project to, to see how this should influence or what changes absolutely, are needed? Absolutely. And, uh, and we're proposing challenge-based learning and problem-based learning to problematize what teachers are doing. And it's part of my research. I think you've read that I'm, I'm a researcher, so I am researching. And I decided to take that research many years after completing my master's because, <coughs> because of the need to explain how to do things differently. And there is a need to change, of ped change pedagogy. So that's the focus of what I'm doing. And uh, te student, teachers and students will take it differently depending on leadership. That's why leadership is so important. And it's, it, the change is big, but it's not difficult. It's not difficult. You can take it as small steps. And you can take it as a, uh, in, a, in a small pilot at the beginning and to grow with it. And it can apply to anything you teach. It's a different way of building your thinking as a teacher and as a leader in your school. Allowing and trusting teachers and allowing and trusting students. They're very important. And then one of my questions in, in a, another group of teachers I'm working with is, what enabled you to take that step? And one of the teachers of science is creating something very, it's amazing, uh, is that ACS, she's creating a prenatal uh, environment, an incubator, to, to explain to students uh, reproduction. And so it's very amazing, and she's it, it very nice. And, and then she said, I can't do that because the leadership is enabling me. If it doesn't work, they would have learned why it's not working. So she's not doing this for a competition, and she's not just passing on the knowledge, and she's not using coding, but she's trying to think about how she's designing her learning differently. 
enabling learners to construct their learner, learning by giving them challenges. So I'm developing through my different work, through my work with different teachers, those great examples and how teachers can really change the way they see their teaching and how to engage students early on. If we don't engage them intellectually at the beginning of the lesson or of their challenge, you miss it. And then they're just on the side waiting for you to finish your lesson and then they will find a way to ask after the lesson what, what happened in that lesson. Anyone else want to ask a question? Yeah. Do you have an example of lesson to show us how we use files? There's a lot. Yeah, and we're developing them now. We're developing more, more examples, uh, uh, proper lesson plans for teachers and students uh, to go through for using Scratch, using Python, using all the activities you can do on the Pi, uh, and beyond that as well. Uh, globally, there's a lot of resources. I mean, everything's open source as well. You can, um, you, UK, there's an examination body called OCR. They're doing a lot of open source uh, lesson plans for teachers and students. And, and together, myself and Eliane are developing it for the, for the Lebanese context. Everything we're developing will be free yeah. and available and open online, open source. Do you think this part can place uh, an iPad? I teach a teaching sure. college at this school that is uh, on iPad system. So do you think this simple part can replace iPad? What, what's nice about the Pi is that because it's 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 simple and and kind of um, uh, lower lower speed than an like, like iPad, for example, is that it encourages the children to uh, to do more with it. With an iPad, it, it's like a one way. It can be a one way system. It depends how you design the content, but it can be just you know you're looking at the iPad, you're swiping through, you're clicking around, you're not really interacting. Um, with the Pi, you 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 can interact and beyond you need the to think. yeah and beyond just the coding, there's a, a lot of things you can do with the hardware itself, from robotics, which are the kids at Dujois are doing now, um, from doing art projects, you can embed the Pi into other projects such as uh, like an interactive art project. Um, you can do a basic electronics. You can go way beyond what you can do do with an iPad. The iPad is primarily a consumption device. Um, but the, the, the Pi, for its, for its cost and what it enables, is um, you know really really intriguing. We have actually uh, we brought this along with us. Uh, you guys can have a look at it when we uh, finish the session. This I bought these this in a newsagent in Lebanon. Uh, this is uh, Raspberry Pi for beginners, and it goes through not only what we've been talking about today, which is Scratch, but all the way A to Z from from how to set one up to all the kind of different projects that you can do. Um, all the hardware projects, all the, uh, they've even sent a pie to uh, the edge of the atmosphere to take photos of, of what it looks like. There's projects where they did it in the UK, they put a, a weather balloon, they strapped a pie to it uh, with a camera, it went up to uh, a height where the balloon burst, and on, the way, on its way down it took photos of, of the Earth. So, I mean, it's these kind of activities that something like this can support. And, for, and because it's so cheap, you know, you don't, you don't think about it. You're not sending a $500 iPad up there. You're sending something that costs $25. Uh, yes. Yeah. So, the students uh, will sign this design challenges or design challenges, or is it something that teachers uh, impose on them or ask them to do? Like, do they have room to? Yeah, sure. I mean, once, once I think, I think the the courses that we're designing is to give them a good introduction and and uh, kind of framework to work in. But once a, ch a child grasps this, they 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 move way beyond from what we can teach them. I mean, their, their minds are, are at a state where they can just accelerate all this learning, um, and they go way way beyond the the, the students at Dushwai. When I went there to uh, sit in on a lesson. They are asking me programming questions that I would, um, you know, I would expect from some a new graduate, maybe 25, going to his first job. I was astounded. I was like, "Wow, that's really amazing that you." And they they did that on their own. They went home. They they did some reading, and they're like, "Oh, you know, we know that we can do these activities on the Pi. We want to do these, and we, we want to learn this area of Python." And I was like, "Wow, that's incredible. How do you guys know that?" Um, you know, it's, it's questions that I would expect from a new graduate. Yes. So the students who uh, are interested in programming and learning Arabic, if they pursue that project, 
two days or so? No, yeah. it was last week. That so was last week, so yeah. we were going to have to pursue that project. We're going to allow but this is a year. Yeah. We're very excited but about it. Without your consent, we would have been mentioned. Again, we're not, it's, it's not, we're not the gatekeepers of this. We're not, we're not the people saying we're going to allow or disallow. It really needs to come from the, ed, from the student teacher community, from, from the teachers I themselves. Know. I totally get that. I used to head a school, okay, so I totally get that. I just want to know if the kids, if, all, all I was asking that for is to find out, do they, if they come up with these grand ideas, great ideas, do they pursue them, or does it stop there? Like, you know, so many things happen in schools, and they take things get taken so far, and then it's over because the time is up, you know, or the year ends, or the funding is up, mm -hmm. or you leave and you go back uh, to where you ever you came from, and so then it's over. Or they get this great idea, but everybody kind of thinks well, we already have Arabic curriculum, so we don't need them to do that. So you know that's really great. They have this great idea. It's awesome. Let's write about it in a journal. Let's publish that article or whatever. But did the kids actually get to pursue that? Because that's that was their interest. So I, I think a lot of times kid, the kids' uh, ideas and I'm a total believer in everything you're doing. So like I'm not trying to poke any holes in what you're doing. No, but I think what you're saying is that saying it's down to the school as well. It's, There's ownership. More than that, like exactly. it's, it's that we as adults don't value, always value. The kids' ideas, questions, challenges, as much as we value our own, okay? So, like, we still think our ideas about curriculum and about what they should be doing are superior to theirs. Hey. We know better. <clears throat> yes, you're right. We still ask that question about are they going to learn, if they go and do that, they're going to be wasting their time not learning what they're supposed to learn? Like, or are they going to be learning something? But that will be creating time? their learning. Completely, and letting them go do that, okay? I'm one of those lunatics that that stuff. But um, but I but I don't see that like in the larger population, even in this conference since yesterday, since last night, the ninety-five percent of what I've heard, this is the first time I've heard positive things about technology in any session. I wanna uh, so I wanna just just sessions, jump into what you're I saying. I feel like all I've heard is fears and fears and fears and fears and how to be a controlled mm -hmm. monster and still get what we want. You know, so like I'm really happy like to have this kind of project. I'm only sad that it's only happening in one school. No, but again, I, I think it's down to, and what you're saying is, we need to build capacity into the school system. Like, I think we're, we're here. I mean, we're here, as you said, you, you know, you're saying, you know, why don't you go out there and do it? Like, we're doing it, but we need to, as, uh, while we roll out the technology, while we explore what's possible, we need to build capacity into the schools and into the school, schooling system, which, as you know, I mean, you've been a teacher yourself, is um, a traditional, um, not behind the times, but it, it's a change. And it's a change that has only started happening in the last 10 years. And I'm sure, you know, projects like Dorshway, these are shining examples of what's possible. And I think we will get there. And I think once the, the school system comes around to, to supporting this, this, these kind of initiatives, then for sure the students are going to be able to uh, go way, way beyond of what we can teach them. I, wa I want to just jump in here. Um, my understanding, first to answer your question about this conference, it's not a conference to my understanding, it's a symposium where we're supposed to just throw these questions and then share where we are. Right, and that's what I expected. That's really not what I've experienced as an attendee. What so, I've experienced a lot of negative, negative opinions. But that's very important because if that is expressed then there is a fear out there because teachers are really, it's, it's hard, it's hard to change your pedagogy. It's a change of learning. It's really all about learning. It's what we do with it. And, and, and that, that's where the challenge is, is a, ch a change in us, in how we use and make use of it. And in terms of your question uh, to allowing yeah, where students... Too, and policy makers, because I think that yeah. teachers, I've also heard this several times, yeah. that teachers are the obstacle. Teachers need to change. Teachers need to be more open-minded. I agree. Okay. But I also realize uh, that rarely do teachers have much autonomy in all the elements that are important in having this kind of thing take hold. Um, teachers have little say and little voice in any of it. And or to the students, frankly. Students and teachers have the least voice in here in Lebanon, anyway, in, 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 a, in a lot of this kind of stuff. And so, like, it's hard to imagine how it's going to 
grow unless you know the administrators, the policymakers, sir, the ministry, all these people stop thinking in terms of trying to figure out how to control it and figure out how to give people autonomy to use it. These are tools after all. They're tools to do things that we can't do without them. Okay? And that's it. That's the simplicity of it. I just want to also go to the last point you mentioned about um, us being there today, not being there tomorrow. I think we need to just I think it's very important to think about this as an ownership. Like, yeah, we're here today, we might not be, but there's a community and understanding the concept of a change in what community is and the ownership that students said, I want to connect with somebody at MIT. Well, fantastic. We will, there's a community there to support everyone to understand that change. And it's not only James and Eliane. It's not only Mark and the principal at Durashway. It's every principal that can do this. And yes, we will take the, the, what the students want to do, what they said. It's respected. So in the same way that the teacher said, I won't change, that's your code. That's what you wrote. Let's look into it. Rather than just say, that is better. We take this proposed by some kind of an expert. We can do the same in every class, listening to students. And yes, we will take their proposition, proposition of working on Arabic. Um, and, and that's community, the concept of community context has changed. So sharing, if you go on the site, is explore, create, and share. And that's a big thing in terms of looking what are others doing, what can I learn from it, not how can I just dilute my effort into saying I'm doing something in the classroom. Sorry, yes. But I hope that, that we also work on sharing within Lebanon. It's wonderful to say, I'm going to connect with someone at MIT. What about, let's, in Dwight Shore, let's connect with someone in Akar, yeah. in Tiffany, in Marja Yoon. We're in inviting you. We're inviting you to the first off. Together. It's the first off. Here. Yeah, they are. It's really important. They um, are. And also not between just schools, but between the, the children of a school and the children of a refugee camp, for example. Exactly. That, that to me is really, really powerful. You know, it, you it, get it, kids together. It's what, exactly. what Mr. Mark was saying before about motivation. What's, where does the motivation come from? You already talked about one of the answers. You yeah. talked about the answer in Louisiana. It's giving kids agency, true agency, to follow their path, their way. Not what we as adults and the teachers, the ones who know better, are telling them to do. Those kids got super excited because they had a problem that was theirs. It was, they, they, they don't like Arabic, how can we fix it? He was not, they identified the problem, he presented them with a tool to make a solution, and fireworks went off. The kids were totally excited, that is where you find motivation. You give the kids agency to truly identify their problems and help them find solutions and resources to solve problems that are theirs, that they own. Exactly. And, and, and if we, if we go, if Ilian and James disappear tomorrow, do you think the kids will stop? Of course they won't. The kids it, won't stop. They won't stop. But They'll carry the on. Them, but they have an amazing, the environment at school, what I've started with the, amaz the yeah. amazing environment at school. So yes, we are important. And I said at the beginning, my idea in this was not to hold hand teachers. And we will not hold hand teachers. It's not the purpose. It's to guide teachers in the same way you expect them to also explore. It's not didactic. And the process will continue, and that's the importance of having an online community there, which is created by MIT for scratch. Irrespective of sharing here, we're inviting everybody at Durashwir. Who will join, right? And understanding that there's a lot in our community to come and see. Before starting to share online, come and see. Initiatives like this don't always have to start off in a school as well. I mean, we're lucky in Dushwe, but it, you know, in, in the UK, it started off in youth clubs, in after-school projects, and now, um, in other countries, as well as now Lebanon, it's working its way into the school system, purely because the school system is slower on the uptake uh, for, for some of these initiatives. But now it's being integrated, now we're seeing it go into the school systems, and, but it started outside the school system. So it, I, I think it's that... Outside the school system. Yeah, yeah, yeah. we know that. Yeah. Or after school, you know, groups catering to after school activities for kids doing robotics as well as scratch programming. And yeah. And we're also, we, we're also doing that in parallel. We're doing both sides. We're working on uh, in the schools, but we also want to help the community here in Lebanon uh, re really accelerate and flourish. Are you doing the same for the Syrian refugees? 
Yes, that's so. This is. Yes, yes. So I, I want, um, and why I've teamed up with Eliane from UNICEF is to bring this opportunity not only to the public schools in Lebanon, but also to the refugee camps, into community centres, into areas where we have some of the most vulnerable children. And what, they should benefit from this as well. This is not just for, um, you know, the, 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 yeah, the Lebanese or, or, the, or uh, a, a one, one culture group, one uh, or, or of a certain uh, means. This is, this is open and for everyone. And the reason I've chosen the pie as a tool, as you said, is because it's cheap. And, and it's cheap and it's creative. Is it accessible here now in Lebanon? Can you find these in the shops? This is something we're also working on we're together. Working on yeah, this. We're, we, um, so from the UK, I have good relationships with suppliers there, and we're now looking at how we can bring a complete kit to Lebanon um, uh, for mass distribution to whoever wants it. Uh, and how far ahead are we with this? How soon? Very close. Very, very, very close. close. Yeah. And when will we know that it's here? We'll, we'll let you know, yeah. And we're, we're building a website, we're building a, uh, a, whole, a whole community around this. We have a blog that we, we've just started. Uh, we only started about uh, a month and a half ago. Uh, it's called Pi for L. Pi for L. And we'll, sh we'll share the links through... Uh, through through yeah, the school. Yeah, through I the mean, school. they have your emails, and we will share the blog <laughs> and the information and the invitation to do Rishwe. And uh, we remain connected with uh, with all the information on the follow-up yeah. and, and with the you, Arabic project. If you go to unicefstories.org, you'll see uh, the links um, uh, to, to the various blogs um, and uh, more information are on the PI initiative. I, I have one comment I'd like to make. Thank you for all this information. I had never heard of the Raspberry Pi. When we began, we started to talk about Raspberry Pi. So I was thinking of actual Pi's. I was lost. <laughs> so it's been very enlightening to hear all of this. Um, I'm taking away from this today a lot of um, positive ideas, a lot about self-exploration, allowing the learners to find their way um, through this and to teach themselves how to learn. And I am an art teacher here, the head of the art department, and there are many times when I've met people that are artists and they fall back, they say, but I'm self-taught. I don't have any um, academic background. And I always say, well, that's, that's not what's important about being an artist. It's about having being self-taught. It's through teaching yourself and discovering things and exploring and experimenting that you will learn more and develop more. And I just, it kills me when they say they're self-taught. I say, it's the best. You know, you didn't have somebody telling you what to do all the time. The guidelines are good. and achieve something, but uh, I just want to thank you for enlightening us and um, hope you to, to get my hands on one soon. Sure, we'll keep you updated with that and we'll share our plans on, on how we scale it out here. Okay, I want to ask about the website, it's unicefstory.com. Unicefstory.org is the, um, is the innovation we will, blog. We will be sharing all the links necessary for you, thank you. Uh, on your behalf, I would like to thank our two panelists. I would like to thank you for your presence. Uh, I would like to end with this thought that working in education is actually teaching with today's tools our learners to try and deal with problems in the future that we do not know which will be and to uh, actually behave in situations that do not exist yet. So this is part of our uh, effort, part of our trying to transform things and change them positively. Uh, this cannot be the work of one person nor one institution. This is a group work, this is a society work, this is a global effort that we need to put together. This is why this symposium was at the beginning thought of and implemented. Thank you for your presence. Thank you, Mrs. Metney, and thank you, Mr. Cronin, board. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.